Hey everyone, today we're talking about how to use Photoshop's AI generative fill to make parallaxing jobs easier, like you see in this example. Let's get started. Hey everyone, my name is Cameron with Motion Science. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Today we're talking about how we can use AI in Photoshop to use generative fill to make parallaxing easier. By that, I mean filling in backgrounds and expanding edges. What used to be a very tedious process is now very easy, thanks in part to AI. So before we get started today, I wanna to invite you to download my free PDF guide. It's my complete guide to mastering organic motion design. If you like the motion design that you see me create here on the YouTube channel and you wanna create renders that are less digital and more tactile and organic, I highly encourage you to go check it out. It's motionscience.tv slash guide. It's absolutely free. You won't regret it. Now let's dive in and let's check out Photoshop's AI generative fill. I do want to mention that this only works in Photoshop 2024 or newer. The first step is to select our lasso tool and I will speed up this process, but essentially you just wanna go around your subject in the photo like we see here. I'm going around this little boy and I'm also making sure to include the shadow on the ground. And with him selected, it doesn't need to be perfect. We're just gonna click Generative Fill, Generate, and Photoshop spits out three different variations of what the photo would look like without the boy in the image. And so I go back and forth and look at all three variations and look at the subtle differences. So I really like version one with the post in the center of the fence. Next, I'm going to select the crop tool and I'm going to expand the edges left and right to make this a horizontal image for HD video purposes. And once it's expanded, all I have to do is click generate again and it's going to expand the images of the photograph. And again, it spits out three different variations and I'm paying close attention to the details on the sides to see what works and what doesn't. If one doesn't work, I can generate this again and get completely new variations, but I do like this version here. So I'm gonna go with that. I'm gonna duplicate the bottom layer, drag it to the top, and I'm gonna rename it boy. And for this next step, there's a few ways you can do this. I'm gonna go old school. I'm gonna select the pen tool. And with the pen tool, I'm going to zoom in and draw a mask around the boy. This for me is an old school method that just gets the best results possible. Yes, it takes a few minutes to do this, but at the end of it, it looks really good. I'm also going to pay a close attention to the path of the shadow and make sure to include that as well. Once I've gone around the entire boy and his shadow with the pen tool, I'm gonna to close the path and I'm gonna rename that work path boy. Click OK. And then I'm gonna make a selection. I always like to do a very small feather radius. So we'll do a radius of one. And then you can see here, I've got four layers. One layer is the boy. One layer is the original image. One layer is the painted in foreground and one layer is the expanded edges. I'm gonna select all three of the bottom layers and I am going to merge them into one layer so that we have the boy layer and we have a single background layer. With that done, I'm going to jump over into After Effects. I'm going to import as a composition, retain layer sizes. I'm gonna double click to open up that pre-comp. I'm gonna select both layers here and I'm going to copy and paste them into an HD comp that I have set up here. This is an HD 1920 by 1080. You can see that the photograph is very large. So I need to position the boy in the background layers roughly in the frame. I'll tick the 3D box. And next I'm gonna add a new 3D camera. 35 millimeter is just fine. I'll click okay. Now I'm going to change views to two views. And for the left view, I find that it's easier to work with a top view for large images like this. Switch to the top view and I'm gonna take the background layer and I'm gonna push it way back in Z space to create some separation from the background to the foreground. Next, I'll select the camera and I'm gonna pull it back on Z space as well so I can frame up the boy with the background fence. Back to one view, I'm going to select my camera tool by hitting the C key and I'm gonna move around the composition and find a decent framing. I'm also gonna hit C again to dolly out to zoom out of the composition. Hit C again to pan around. So I get something I like. I'm gonna set a keyframe for the starting position, go to the end of my timeline, set another keyframe, and do a simple push in with the camera to create some parallax. 
I'm gonna scale up the background image and I wanna make sure that the background image is filling the frame. And I'm gonna reposition the background image, scale it up a little larger, move it up a little bit in the frame. At this point, I'm gonna jump back into Photoshop and I'm just looking here to see the original composition of where the boy sat in the frame. I don't wanna to get too far away from this in After Effects. So I'm referencing his height in the image and the composition is not exactly how it was in Photoshop, it's close enough. And I'll scroll through my timeline here and see if I'm getting some good parallax. Fine tuning the camera position, just kind of looking to see what is available to create the most parallax in this shot. Again, scrolling through the timeline, looking at the parallax, it's, it's very subtle at this point, and previewing it just to take a look again. And noticing it's a little too subtle for me, so I'm probably gonna have to push back that background image. So I'm gonna do just that. I'm gonna take the background image and pull it back in Z space by a very large number. And I'm also gonna scale it back up to fit into the frame. Now that the background image is separated further from the foreground image, the parallax is gonna be a little bit more extreme. I also am noticing that I may get more parallax going left to right versus pushing in on the image. And you can see here, it's exactly what's happening. So this is me just playing around with the camera to get the best possible move. Does it need to be a push in? Does it need to be a pan across the image? And this is getting more parallax. Now I'm gonna try adding a second camera to experiment with a second camera move. And for this test, I'm going to change from one node to two node camera, click OK. For those of you who follow my YouTube tutorials, you'll notice that the majority of the time I'm using a one node camera because it's a much simpler camera to use. I can get more of the, the looks I'm going for. But for this, I wanted to try a camera that rotated around the boy. So a two node camera creates a point of interest. Like we can see here, you can see that the point of interest is on the image on the left side, the camera is pulled back and it creates a line from the point back to the camera. And I'm gonna push my camera back in Z space. Once I get further enough back, I'm gonna set a keyframe. And then I'm also going to adjust the X position. So now at this point, you can see that the camera is starting to move around the boy. It just creates a little bit of rotation around the boy because we are using a point of interest. Go to the end of my timeline, and move the camera to the other side. And it's a very subtle rotation, but for an example like this, it works very well. I'm also pushing in the camera a little bit. Again, kind of fine tuning where that camera needs to be. The little box we can see here is actually the first camera and previewing this. And for a nice detail, we can turn on a depth of field. And because this camera is so far back in Z space, we have to really crank up that aperture. And if I switch to two views here, you're gonna see the focus distance has to go very far forward in Z space to hit the image of the boy. Because our focus distance is so long, we also have to crank up our aperture extremely high to get any type of depth of field here. So I'm experimenting with the values to find a value that works going back to one view, turning off and on to see the depth. It's very subtle. Finding the need to crank up the aperture even more to around a thousand pixels. And then at this point, I'm gonna increase the blur level to 200% just to see it happening. It's a little bit too much at this point. So we'll reduce it back down about 150%. Let's actually drop it to 125%. And we'll change the preset from fast rectangle to heptagon. This just creates a little bit nicer blur and the preview is looking really nice at this point. We could call the animation good at this point, or we could also finish it with an adjustment layer. And to that adjustment layer, we're going to apply a sapphire effect, a lighting effect called light leaks. And I found that in the light leaks, if I load the presets here, I like this one here at the bottom called soft blue. I'm gonna click load, and it creates just a really nice subtle flicker like we would see in a documentary. It looks awesome, I really dig this, and we're gonna call it good. So you can see here, it's a pretty awesome parallax shot. It was really easy to set up in Photoshop and then animate in After Effects. I hope that you enjoyed this lesson. As always, thank you for tuning in. I wanna invite you to download my free PDF guide over at motionscience.tv slash guide. It's gonna help your renders look more organic and less digital. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.